saying, hey, it's weird to me that you guys just put out one song and then didn't address the elephant in the room. And we said, well, dude, we don't know how to do it. And I, I don't want to like make them feel bad for hating me even. It's just like, okay, you hate me, then you hate me, so what? I, I, got, I, I have no choice but to move on with my life. Use EMG pickups because they help you get the heaviest tone possible. Head over to emgpickups.com and use my promo code HEAVY at checkout and get 15% off. And then once you write the heaviest song of all time, head over to distrokid.com slash VIP slash Garza and save 30% off your membership to get all your songs on all streaming platforms. And now to the heaviest podcast of all time. Tim Lambesis, it's good to have you, man. Yeah, it's I've been, great to be here. I've been looking forward to this conversation ever since we spoke on the phone. Yeah. It's cool, man. So so thank you for make, making that drive. For sure, yeah. I, sick. I mean, Ken told me he ran into you, and uh, you guys had a great conversation, and then obviously we talked shortly after that. So Yeah. It must be so crazy to be in a band with the guitar player from Unearth, Ken. He, he's, he's a fucking psycho. I love yeah. him. Well, he's actually, uh, when he first started performing with us, he kind of tamed it down a little bit because he's like, well, he's like, am I, am I supposed to like be as late I can or am I supposed to be like myself? And and we just like said, dude, it's okay to be yourself. Like I know there's normally yeah. not guys on stage doing push-ups during an as late I show, but <laughs> if you want to do it, go for it. You know. I know, yeah. It's like, oh, you know, just be, be you. Yeah, yeah. You know, but I think he's doing a good job. Yeah, and I think like um, for me as, a, as like a front man, like I, I smile a lot more having him on stage. Not that I um, don't smile with like, you know, um, like like Ryan and Nick playing with us also, those guys make me smile, but Ken's like literally like making jokes during the set, you know, what I mean? making sure everybody in the oh, stage is having a great vibe, you know? So, yeah, it's awesome, yeah. yeah. Dude, it, this vibe will affect your vibe, you know? Yeah, for sure. Oh, shit, I'm having I mean, a, lot, a lot of fun. Cool. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know what I didn't know about you? And I just found out, uh, you were in Point of Recognition. Yeah, yeah. For like, for, for like, for like a, hot, a hot year. It was like, it was you and Jordan 2001? Yeah, so Jordan and I... Um, when they were getting ready, I think the record was called Day of Defeat, and we started writing for that record. We did a couple songs with them. The original versions of those songs was, was Jordan and I performing on it. And then um, I was on tour with Asla Dying at the time, and I got a phone call. They said, hey, we want to be a little bit more full-time touring. You're going to have to choose. Like, we hate to put you in this situation, but you got to choose. Mm -hmm. And Asla Dying was definitely the smaller band at the time, yeah. but it was like kind of my baby because I you know, started it. So yeah. I said, hey, um, you know, it's probably a weird decision for you guys to hear because – I'm turning down the bigger band to do the smaller band, but like this is what I believe in. So, yeah, probably made the right choice. <laughs> no, you, you made the right choice. It's always like a conflict in which I mean, I mean, you're you're from San Diego, yeah, you know, and we we we've been around the same uh, Southern California hardcore metalcore scene, and it's very common for the like the smaller band to join the bigger bands, and it never really worked out, yeah. you know. So what? Yeah, what made you really stay? Like you get like okay to someone else, I could be like, oh, I could join the bigger band. This is like an opportunity. But what made you like, I'm going to stay with my fucking band, you know? Uh, well, there's a lot of things that are interesting about that. Um, it was just kind of gut instinct at the time because yeah. um, I, I can't really like put like a, a lot of logic to it. The, the logic actually would have driven me the other way because I, um, this is kind of an unknown fact, but like I wanted to be a guitar player or a bass player in a band. I didn't want to be a singer. So even yes. in the early days of Azalea Dying, I actually, um, you know, I told Jordan, I said, hey, I'm going to keep writing songs with you on guitar. Like, rehearsal was just Jordan and I. I'd play guitar, he'd play drums, and we'd write songs. I'd, I'd write songs, and, you know, he'd, he'd figure out, like, the best beats for it and stuff like that. And so yeah. that was the general vibe of, like, how I wrote the Asla Dying songs. And I said, well, ideally, we find, a, like, a great singer, and then I just play guitar, and that would be my preference. And so Logic is, like, I wanted to play guitar instead of sing. I wanted to be in a, a bigger band that could eventually make, you know, make music full time, and that could be my career. Mm -hmm. And all those things pointed towards, like, going, you know, being a guitar player in a different band, right? Yeah. But my instinct still told me, I don't know why. I don't, I don't actually, like, love being a singer. I love being a, a songwriter. So I kind of did what was, like, against my own logic, but it just my instinct told me to do it. Yeah, you went with the instinct. That, yeah. That, that's it. It's funny, like, was... Did you, so you, did, you, you're the founder of Asley Dine, or is it you and Jordan? Like how, where, at what point did Jordan come in the picture? Um, so really, like, technically speaking, the foundational songs that became the original um, Asley Dine full length, a, yes. a bunch of those songs I had worked on with a friend of mine from high school uh, in 2000, before I, I met Jordan. And oh, then, wow. And then I had those songs, and I came to Jordan, and I said, hey, I'm looking for a drummer. Are you interested? Like, here's the, here's. Uh, you know, some demos of the material. Okay. And he was like, yeah, yeah, I'm interested. So it was like kind of a situation where it was like, you know, I'm, I'm 
truly the founding member, I guess, or the the core of the the songwriting team, so, yes. so to speak. Um, you know, but of course, I, I don't play drums, so I had to have the best drummer I knew, and he was by far the best drummer I knew in in the San Diego area at the time. Uh, at, le- at least it was like you know available and stuff. And so mm-hmm. um, we didn't have a pre existing friendship. We just kind of had crossed paths, and I knew he was a great drummer. I said, "Do you want to do this?" And he said, "Yes." And then, of course, our friendship and relationship grew from there. Oh wow, interesting because. It seems like uh, Asley Dion is like your, that's your like vision and like your gut feeling, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of a weird. If you listen to like the very early stuff, which I, I don't really love, like the, the, the first yeah, Zale? The Zale parts? Yeah, those parts, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I had been playing guitar for literally like like about a year or less at that point. But I was, wow. I was the guy writing the guitar parts, you know what I mean? So it was like, mm. it's very simple, but had like an energy this like, um, I don't know, just kind of like, generally speaking, dark enough to fit my vocals but like yeah. enough, you know, energy and melody to like not be too boring for, for how simple it was. You know what I mean? And that was like, that's all I could really do at that time. And then I, of course I progressed as a guitar player. And by the time yeah. we did our next full length, which was, uh, you know, I had written 94 hours in the opening riff to that. It's not like shreddy or anything, but you could tell as a guitar player, I'd gotten, you know, obviously much better. Yeah. And so I was writing riffs more like the 94 hours riffs by, by the time we did our next record. And that's why yeah. our records just progressively. And then Phil came and joined the band and Phil yeah. is a riff machine. So you had like my foundational ideas, and then Phil, really just taking all that to the next level. The way the way the sound has progressed, at, at that, and we're going to get into that. I have it all timeline here. Is like, was that like the way the band sounds now? Was that is kind of similar to what was inside your mind, your ears, or soul? Like, you know, year two thousand to like two thousand one. You had like a, a sound that you, you were trying to get out. Um. The very, very early days, I mean, there was, like, Living Sacrifice was my favorite, um, like, like heavy, rhythmically um, rhythmically based kind of band. Like, I, you know, like, Meshuggah was a little too much for me at the time. Sure. Living Sacrifice was still, like, mostly, you know, groovable in the 4-4, although they had the polyrhythms and stuff. And so it was, like, yeah. kind of, like, to me... Um, a little, a little bit more like emotionally, like where I, where I identified with the, like the rhythmic part of the band. Okay. So that rhythmic part I've always wanted to have, and then um, the melodic part sort of progressed as I became a better guitar player. And then, like I said, when Phil came, I mean, he's even a much, much better guitar player than me, obviously. So the, the original vision was like more like rhythmically based, and yeah. then um, all the melody options became like endless once you know once you have like talented musicians playing with you. Totally. It's uh, Tim was kind of bizarre about that. Is we have that in common. Like we had like a vision, then you kind of get like a a member to me that 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 was Mitch, and you kind of like get talented people, and eventually like your vision kind of evolves, right? Yeah, for sure. It's crazy, huh? Yeah, and of course, like for when it comes to what well, I guess what we call in our genre clean vocals, which is kind of a funny thing, but singing, yeah. you know, sure. Um, you know, I had written the, all the original choruses for our first few records, but I don't really sing in a tenor range, so I was always like, hey, can you try these vocal melodies I wrote? You know, I'd Whoa. ask us different guys that were in the tenor range to sing them for me. Yeah. Um, and I can sing fine in a baritone range, but I just, I don't like baritone vocals. You know what I mean? There's like very few bands that I can yeah. take seriously that have a baritone vocalist. So wow, that's just, uh, and then of course, uh, Josh became not only a great singer for that range, but then really took the melodies on our last couple of records and, and became the, the melody writer. That's why those courses feel a little bit more like him. It's not, not like him singing one of my courses. It's him singing his own courses, you know? So yeah. Yeah, there, uh, yeah, there's definitely a switch between each one. He's a fucking great singer, man. Yeah, he is incredible. I, I love yeah. him. Since so uh, I know we won't, won't get too much into your first record because I know uh, that just brings a pain. <laughs> no, I, it's funny. Um, real quick, early story question or early, early story comment is: um, Do you remember that band Falling Cycle? We played their last show, man. Okay, so so sick. So Falling Cycle for a brief moment, we we toured with Falling Cycle, and for a brief moment, they had two guys that left, mm-hmm. and so then. I said, well, you guys need a guitar player? I, I would love to do it. And so I adapted the Falling Cycle mindset, and I said, well, I'll write a couple songs for what would be the next Falling Cycle record. And then, serious? Yeah, yeah. And, and then so I started, like, riffing a little bit more melodically like them. And then they said, actually, you know what? Like, we kind of, like, rescind our offer because we, we have somebody who lives, like, closer to us. It's just kind of, like, a better fit, you know, blah, blah. And I was like, hey, I mean, we, we literally, all we had was a couple lunches to talk about being in the band together. We never, like, actually, you know, put together a record. So I was like, well... I never even showed them the songs, and I said, but these songs are still cool. So I made them feel more like what I felt like was Asley Dying at the time, and that's literally the, the uh, melodic metal influence of Asley Dying was sort of like derivative because it's like Falling Cycle was influenced by In Flames, and then I was influenced by Falling Cycle, who's influenced by In Flames. Yeah. And then, of course, I got into In Flames because of that. You know, and so it's like you have this like rhythmic living sacrifice side, 
and then this like melodic inflame side and like yeah. i'm trying to figure out how to put them together as a uh is a learning guitar player you know who's still like literally never taken lessons just just playing what i think sounds cool and and, and fun to me you know and and yeah. this many years later it's like you know influencing a genre i'm not saying that we're foundational but we're definitely uh, one of the earlier bands to uh yes. you know, people think of metalcore and they think of there's a there's an asley dying sound you know yes and so part of that is just that like you know self-taught just piecing things together that just feel right to me yeah dude that's that, that's so crazy and uh what's kind of bizarre about that first record is that it got that got you signed essentially to metal blade correct uh yeah it was actually the the um the demos uh there's this EP we had where like we had kind of taken that slightly more melodic sound, like I was telling you from like influence from Falling Cycle, me playing, yeah. wanting to play guitar in that band. Mm -hmm. and it was actually that EP that they were most interested in. They they actually even told us, hey, you know, your first full length's fine or whatever, but like we like the direction you're going in this EP. Interesting how they uh, they they saw some. Yeah, I, I, that kind of blow, blows me away. You know, well at, at the time they signed us and Black Dolly Murder. Oh wow! And, and um, their thing was like, okay, these are two younger band at the time you know we were like the the new wave of whatever became you know metal blades new wave for sure yes and um they actually felt like uh at the time hey black dolly is you know probably the band that's gonna like really cross over for them because it's, it's their, their traditional like death metal audience but they're like these younger guys that are gonna um put like a, a modern twist on it and and i think they've they felt like that was most likely going to be the band that like connected for them mm -hmm. but they also had us as sort of like i wouldn't say the backup band but like you know the other the other band right whoa and uh you know of course that flipped not 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 to take anything from, from black dollar murder incredible band i think but they they've still stayed within the the ceiling of like death metal or melodic death metal yes whereas i think we crossed over a little bit because um a lot of people came to our shows and said hey i don't normally like metal but for some reason i like you guys and that was something yes. that I I felt like was really important for the genre at the time. Yeah, and and you and you stuck by that too. Every record like you guys did was like a big step. Like a, a, I mean, a step from like that first record to to Frail Words. Like that's a massive step. And then you you said you mentioned that you wrote like ninety four hours and and of uh, forever, mm -hmm. and uh, and you produced that, correct? Yeah, so at the time we just hired a great engineer, and, yes. but he hadn't really done a, a, a metalcore record like that. Like, well, I mean, not very many engineers had at the time. Yeah. So we felt like, well, he's a great engineer. He knows the technical side, but he doesn't know our songwriting structure and this kind of genre. So mm -hmm. we felt like, from a producing standpoint, self-producing was was the best option. Yeah. Um, but from a technical standpoint, I was I was still learning as an engineer. I mean, I'm a I'm a good engineer now, and I could put together records from start to finish, no problem. But at that time, I you know, all I knew how to hit was space bar to start the recording, right? So you know, good. so yeah, yeah. Wow. Um, so then now we're going into like 2004, and uh, where? How did like Phil and, and Nick come into picture? Yeah. Um, Phil, see, Phil got the phone call. Um, our guitar player who was playing with us at the time, his name was Chris Lindstrom. Uh, he was from New Jersey, and he was kind of like a transplant to like you know tour with us, and so he was like. You know, he's kind of like just away from his normal world and just realized, you know, this isn't really for me, this like touring, mm -hmm. living off of $5 a day in a van all year long. And, yeah. Um, him and I are still friends to this day, but like, he, you know, he just realized it wasn't for him. And so he said, hey, I'm not going to like leave you guys high and dry, but when you guys find a new guy, I'd like to, you know, go back to living in New Jersey. And so mm -hmm. um, I called Phil because he was from another local San Diego band and said, hey, dude, uh, you know, no really promises on anything, but if you can do this, like just fly out to this tour hang out with us for a couple of weeks until you feel like you're comfortable with the songs and then start performing and we'll send Chris home as soon as you're ready. And uh, that's how Phil joined the band. Um, and then uh, Nick joined the band in a very, very similar story because those early days of touring, as you know, are very grueling. Yes. So um, our other guitar player, uh, Evan White, um, he had some like personal relationship stuff that's just very stressful to deal with on the road and just was like, hey man, like I don't really feel like I'm able to like you know, put together the life I want to put together with the stress of all this, you know, insanity of being on, on tour and stuff. Yeah. Said, I'd like to go home too. And it was a super similar situation where we just said, okay, dude, like, don't leave us high and dry. Give us, a, you know, give us enough time to like, he was on tour, you know, we had a new guy come in, fill in for a little bit mm -hmm. so he could go home. And then when we traveled through the Dallas area, um, we had done some touring with Nick's old band, Evelyn. And so we knew that he was a good guitar player. Uh, we just said, hey, dude, you want to, you want to pick up uh, we, as soon as we get home from this tour, you want to pick up on our next one. And he said, sure. And, uh, you know, for me, like I was never looking for, you know, another songwriter or, um, I just wanted a guy that could do great job performing live. 
And both Phil and Nick did incredible jobs. And then it turns out that, of course, Phil, I didn't know this at the time, but Phil's an incredible songwriter. So, mm-hmm. you know, I got the added bonus of him taking over the vast majority of the, the guitar riffing. Yeah, because playing guitar and riffing are way different than actually songwriting. Yeah, you know? I, I mean, and right. for me, like, I, there's so many great, like, lead solo players out there that can shred, you know, but I'm, I'm not a great guitar player, but I can generally write better songs than a lot of those guys, you know what I yeah. mean? But I could never play a guitar solo even a, a tenth as good as these guys could play. And so there's just so many different nuances to what make a song a song. But I think, like, yeah. the the riffing-based songwriting that, like, Asla Dying is, is that's, like, you know, without Phil, the band really wouldn't have become what it became because he's such, like, a riff-oriented songwriter. Yeah. And uh, I've been having this conversation quite often is that a lot of people don't talk about Phil and his and his incredible guitar playing and and songs. Like he's yeah. a great guitar player, man. Yeah, he is. Shout out, she shout out Phil, dude. He's yeah. amazing. Well, and to me, like as as somebody who most of our riffs are so like rhythmically based, having a tight right hand to me is is way more important than having you know the ability to shred on your left hand for a solo. So like mm-hmm. Phil's right hand, I I don't. I don't know very many people in the world that like have a right hand as good as Phil's. You know, obviously there's some incredible guitar players out there that do, but like, yeah, um, that's one of the things that I think most younger guitar players don't recognize is that if you want to be a great guitar player, especially in the studio and, and live when you're under a microscope, and like there's like, you know, live stream recordings of you playing for, you know, Falcon <laughs> Festival, ninety thousand people, yeah, and yeah. you don't get to redo it. You know, like whatever comes out of your amp is what you know what's actually there forever. Yeah. And you like, listen how tight his right hand is. It's like, dang, you know, this is with him like running around on stage, and he's still got that right hand just locked in. Wow. Yeah, you guys really connected musically, like like right out of the gate. It seems. Phil, uh, Phil and I did for sure, and I think there's um, some creative tension over that because, at the time, I you know I viewed myself as like, hey, I write the guitar parts mostly, and then it was like. But feels like I got all these great ideas. Like, okay, well, I recognize, like, hands down, like, some of your riffs are way better than mine. So it was like, okay, well, who's really in charge of putting together this this mm. song, you know? And so the early, early days, putting our first record together, Shadows Are Security, Phil and I actually had some creative, um, I don't know, like, tension, so yes. to speak, you know? Like, you know, be, like, a little bit dramatic at times. And then we've, like, worked through that. And clearly it's like now we have this understanding of, like, okay, um, you know, Tim might really understand a big picture vibe of what he wants. He might have a couple of riffs that, like, that like have a feeling to them, but like they can all be torn apart and and made more guitar interesting from a guitar player's perspective. And so now I don't yeah. take offense if he wants to rip apart my riffs, and yes. he's, he's not offended if I'm like, hey, I really feel like the structure of the song needs to go this way. And um, this there's nothing but respect now, but in those early days, it created some interesting tension. Oh yeah, like that that those feelings you're like, oh my gosh, you shut up. <laughs> my my my, because because your idea is always better, right? In in in, in your head. Well, like. As a young musician, if somebody says, hey, I don't like that riff, it's like you feel like, I don't like you. I know. And it's like, well, yeah. I wrote that riff, so you're saying you don't like me. And it's like, yes. no, no, that's not what I'm saying. Oh, you know? God. So. It's, so, it's so hard to process when you're, when you're super young. Yeah. But that, that creative tension actually explains, because uh, Shadows, that came out in 2005, that, and again, like another massive jump musically, songwriting, I mean, tones. I mean, how do you convince the band, hey, we're going to have Andy Sneet mix it and pay an ungodly amount of money? <laughs> like, uh, and, and fucking and, and get and, and get and get him to mix it. Yeah, I mean that actually came from um, like, you know, the label was was open to us like self producing again. Yeah, and they just said, hey, you know, you guys self produce because you know what you're doing. But you know, the mix on your last record was was unique and it was quirky and it was cool. But like, you don't want every record to sound like that. And so we yeah. started listening to some of our favorite records at the time. Um, uh, I, I don't know if you remember some of those early Arch Enemy records that uh, Andy Sneap mixed, but like, yeah, great. You know, it's, it's funny. Cause like we listen to them now and it's like, Oh, those aren't the best mixes in the world by today's modern standards. But at that time, those were great mixes, you know? So, yeah. Uh, and obviously Andy Sneap has, has progressed and he does great mixes even still today, but totally that was uh, really where that came from. It's, I mean, it sounds incredible. Like when you're like, have like a fresh year and you put on like, you know, for, for me, you know, uh, I've been listening to, to your music heavily the past week. And like when, man, when darkest nights come on, you're like, Whoa, there's like there's that, that unexplainable like shift you know it's like man like that's you can only do that stuff i feel like so strongly about you can only do that with some creative tension you <laughs> yeah. know you, you kind of can't do stuff like that when it's like ah, yeah. but, one, you know. one of the downfalls though of uh phil and i being so guitar oriented in the way we thought and worked about uh music in that time is that 
um, vocals got put off till very, very last. If, even you know my, my own like fault there because I just was so focused on like the rest of the song. Mm -hmm. Then when it came time to track the vocals, I, I was literally tracking those songs like lie, like one take, like start to finish. Really? Like you know, like modern music, and, and I do this now. I, I just do like one line at a time, make sure I really like it, and move on to the next line. But back then it was like, oh shoot. Um, We've only got like two days left to finish this record, and I haven't tracked vocals yet. So Are you serious? I'm just gonna <laughs> sing the songs like straight through, you know. And, no uh, way. No, and that, and I hate, I hate the vocals on that record for that reason. Really? But, uh, but I mean, you know, it's just, it's a what do you call it? Like a snapshot in time of like where we were at, and yeah. So it's like, you know, I've always, if I could redo anything, even with the quirky mix of Railroad's Collapse and some of these older records, how bizarre the mixes are. If I could redo one thing, I still would just want to redo the vocals on Shadows Are Security because I just had to rush <laughs> through it so fast. So. Oh my goodness, dude! Well, I mean, fans loved it, you know. Yeah, and, and it worked. Love it. Yeah, and, it and, worked. and and obviously, um, the genre at the time, like, you know, there wasn't like the crazy layered vocals like we have now. Like now, it's like, you know, every other line's got a double to it, and then mm -hmm. you know, the big line going into the chorus has got like you know a high and a low together, and then like the chorus has got like six layers of vocals, yes. you know. But back then, it was yeah. literally just like a single vocal start to finish. You know what I mean? So it's just a different kind of era. Yeah, it was a different era, huh? Yeah. Interesting. I mean, obviously that, I mean, that was your first time like really being on like the billboards, like 200, like you're, I'm now, now you're selling a fuck ton of records and now, and now you're on tour with the, uh, with Slipknot. Like, you know, how, like, 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 how'd you guys take that? You know, when like, when you put out a record that kind of, that hits in a big way, like it's, it's really hard to deal with that shit, you know, like and now, now you guys are on a fucking, a big ass tour. Yeah, I said, man, we're, we're just a band from San Diego. I was playing Zero Riffs like fucking a few years ago, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm one of those mindsets. That, like, I don't really um, get to a place where I like. Well, I, I'm, I'm working on this now, but like, where I, where I like, oh, I really enjoy like where we've gotten to. I enjoy, I like, so focused on the journey itself and just like pushing and pushing and progressing. Of course, that like I didn't recognize like, you know, hey, to be a band as young as we were, um, touring with Slipknot or Ozfest or uh, Taste of Chaos and some of these tours where we were very. Highly built, you know. We were we weren't one of the side stage headliners, but we were. Uh, we had a non rotating slot, you know, like on Ozfest, like very very late in the day. You know what I mean? It's like that's a big big deal, and I'd never I, even, I I remember that. Yeah, it was yeah, and I, I never even really took time to appreciate it because I just was constantly looking towards like how do we keep yeah. building? And building to me is still kind of what gets me high to some degree. Like I love writing songs, I love mm -hmm. building, and so um, as much as I love touring. Um, and I, I, I feel like I've adapted to being a front man. I just enjoy mm -hmm. the creative process of like making a record. Yes. You know what I mean? So I, I, and if people didn't know what my face looked like and I could <laughs> be in Slipknot and have a mask on, I mean, yeah. now everybody knows what they look like anyways, but you yeah. know, if I could go to the, the grocery store and nobody ever recognized me, that would be my preference. Yeah, that, that would be pretty sick, huh? Yeah. Man, how, how did the rest of the band take it? Same thing is kind of heads down. We're fucking playing Ozfest. I think I was like a little bit of not like a slave driver, but like a, like a um, always just pushing, pushing, pushing. And I, I think I created a stressful environment of like um, having everybody always focused on like how to get to the next level. Like instead of enjoying Ozfest, it's like all right, Ozfest is going to help us get to this, like whatever that yeah. was. Like uh, you know, we'll finally be able to headline theaters after the Ozfest. You know, and so it's like we're always, always looking for that next thing. And I feel like um, I was such a uh, unstoppable force in the way like my persistence that <laughs> yes. i like that sort of became something that like spilled over into the other guys's mentality a little bit and yeah. you know phil and i really get to en enjoy where we're at now i mean we're on stage at fucking this past year and it's you know this festival sold out at ninety thousand people and we're playing like you know one of the last slots before the sun goes down and it's Damn. like dang like let's like let's just enjoy this moment you know it's actually something i'm able to do now but i never did that in my my earlier career it sucks that it takes you a damn near career to like join that shit, you know. I know. Twenty years later. Twenty years later, dude. Then we're, we're the same way. It sucks. Yeah. My God, dude. Uh, well, how was uh? And then you have a, uh, uh, ocean, between us. That shit comes out. I mean, w when I saw that, like, dude, they're on. They're number eight on a billboard. This this yeah. is a massive deal, dude. Well, I remember um, your guys. I I don't know if um. I don't know the exact timeline, but like when you, you guys were working with, with Jerry Club at the time, and I talked to him, and was like, you know, was talking about, um, you know, how excited I am to see you guys progressing and stuff. And he goes, "Hey, dude, it's really rare to find a band in this genre that you can picture being in the top ten, and you guys are one of them." And he was like, "You know, I feel like Suicide Silence is one of them, and just a band that can actually um, be as heavy as you want to be, but somehow have enough crossover." To where people who normally don't like metal are, are willing to buy and listen to these records and like that's yeah 
that's not only great for like you guys as a band that, you, that, you, that you've been been that way in your career, but it's amazing for the genre as a whole because it needs yes. more bands like that because otherwise, you know, you're not getting any new audiences. Yeah, it's it's massive for bands, any heavy band that could you know, have had that crossover. Yeah, I was always fascinated. Like, uh, I I just want to touch on this. Like, what what is that? Like, what is that like crossover heavy? thing like like how it's funny I, I'm, I'm being and i guess and i'm not talking about I'm, i don't want to talk about myself but you know i'm in a band similar to that like I, yeah like what what is that i don't know because if you listen to an ocean between us it's not a light record by any means it's like no. you know it's got some diversity to it there might be like the closest thing to a ballad we've ever done on that record which is still like not a ballad you know yeah but uh but that wasn't even a single so um you know the singles on there the first single was nothing left which is really um, I mean, the chorus barely even has singing. It's actually, I'm the one singing on that chorus, and I'm, like, yelling in pitch, more or less, not actually even singing. Yeah. Because um, that was really before Josh was officially part of the band and stuff. And so mm-hmm. uh, there's really nothing about it that's, like, technically accessible other than, I don't know, sometimes the the, the right vibe just aligns. I, I don't know what it is, though. I mean, there's, there's other bands that do it. They're just, I mean, Slipknot doesn't have to have a singy single to be a single. They've had some, yeah. of, their, some of their heaviest songs in their whole catalog are still their most popular that's so it's just one of those un- unexplainable things yeah it's for weird sure. yeah it's like oh wait, wait, if you're a part of it holy shit <laughs> awesome dude wow <Yeah. laughs> congrats yeah there's an identifiable energy and emotion to it but it's like how do you put words to that you know I exactly don't know. to me yeah you're right i mean it's just like when i talk about it it's like well there's an energy to it and emo- an emotion to it and a realness to it mm-hmm. whether you like you like it or not i think that's also why the bigger bands are tend to be more polarizing there's just something about like that you're able to put uh you know it's like i think that's what you know and and you guys are one of the biggest metalcore bands on the planet still you know it's like that i mean and then hearing how the band first started it's like well yeah because it's you it's like it's 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 it's, it's not like you but it's you you know i mean it's hard for me to like wrap my mind around because when i started the band i felt like this is going to be a hobby I'm going to pursue as long as I can. And that's why, you know, I, I felt like I'll put college on the back burner, everything else in the back, because I can't come back and do a hobby like this when I'm in my 40s, but I could do it now. Mm-hmm. And I'll take as far as it can go, and then I'll be a big boy and go finish my college degree and go get a normal job and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And the genre as, as a whole changed. Um, yes. You know, our ability as songwriters progressed, like you were saying, and yes. things just kept moving, and they went way beyond what I ever – I mean, I – I heard a story one time that um, Poison the Well made $1,000 to play in San Diego. And I was like, oh, my gosh, are you serious? Like, they made $1,000? That's insane. Yeah. And I was like, dude, that's that's crazy. Like, And I, and it just, I couldn't even wrap my mind around the fact that our genre could make $1,000. And then, you know, here we are, like, <laughs> you know what I mean? O- opening bands, wow. opening ba- bands that are opening for us are literally getting five times that amount of money now. You know what I mean? So it's just, it's just wild. Yeah. Holy shit, dude. Um, how, how was it for? I mean, because you're you're so you're so used to being in, in like the producer side of it. Did you did you struggle like kind of passing it over to like Adam D? Hey, you know, let's let's do your record and have someone else, you know, take. Um, no, take it, was, it was really the only way to force me to like be a vocalist. Really, you know, because mm-hmm. like like I mentioned on Shadows Are Security, I I listen to that record musically and I love it, but vocally I hate it. So it's like, mm-hmm. well, I know I'm capable of doing better than that. But I have to focus on being a vocalist to do that, and which means I can't really be having the producer's mindset. And also, uh, the rest of the the guys at the time were just like, "Hey, you know, let's like do something different." I mean, you've like we we have self produced, or you have been a part of the production team for the last two records, and mm-hmm. you know, it's just it's just time. And I didn't have any resistance to that. I, I look oh, forward great. to it. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Well, obviously, I mean, it worked. So. Yeah. <laughs> Especially for the again, we go back to the the era, and you know, Adam D was just killing as far as like production and, and and recording and I, i'm not sure how, how much of a hand he had in songwriting but yeah he was just the dude yeah for sure and it was crazy to me as a vocalist being like oh wait so i can spend this entire day just working on one song like are you serious like i was like blew my mind i was like <laughs> like i don't have to track like five songs today i just could track one song and then if i don't like something i can come back in tomorrow and fix it yeah. he's like yeah that's how like you should have been doing your vocals this whole time and i was like wow you know, so yeah. I mean, from a budgetary standpoint, we also had the budget to allow for that. You know, Great. whereas yeah. like uh, Frail Words Collapse and Shadows Are Security, I mean, the budgets were so tight that uh, not not because Metal Blade wasn't willing to like help us out or support us, but it's just like 
you know, I didn't even know. Like, I thought, okay, if you spend, um, you know, ten grand on a record, which is like, like, uh, um, prior to mixing, um, for Edwards class, we spent ten grand on it. You know, and that included the studio time. And mm-hmm. studio time back then was like seven hundred dollars a day or something crazy. You know, and yeah. it's like, oh, dude, that means we've only got like, you know however many days and i just felt like yeah that's just i i felt like recording had to be super stressful all the time and there had to be this really crazy deadline yeah and then we did ocean between us it's like oh we're we're not in a rush like if i need to come back even you know even adam d went home and i and i said i, I don't like a couple of these lines and he said well go ahead and punch them in yourself you know go ahead and fix it you know i was like oh i can like fix these myself while adam's home chilling on his couch you know what i mean it's just a different recording mindset oh wow and, and that's actually when i got into some of the the um the early stages of like self recording, like, mm-hmm. and the record after that, I, I got really into like recording myself uh, from there going forward. And yeah. um, our latest record, uh, Shape by Fire, I just recorded myself entirely. Um, of course, I take notes from like Phil would say, Hey, I don't like the way you did this line. You know, can you give me an alternative take? And um, rather than be defensive, I just say, Yeah, dude, if you don't like it, I want you to be proud of the record. And, and of course. He, he takes the same feedback. If I say, Hey, I don't like that guitar, the tail end of that guitar right there, like, can you give mm-hmm. me another option? And we just, we're we're not like a uh, robotic about it, but we're like we try to like remove our emotions and just just take the feedback. Yeah, yeah, totally. Well, I mean, and and that song fucking got nominated for a Grammy. Like that's fucking crazy. Yeah, it's a heavy song, dude. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it, I mean, like I said, that it, we didn't choose the, the like the most accessible song in our catalog to be our single, and I thought that was a cool move that Metal Blade allowed us to do that first of all, and then mm-hmm. and then our fan base like you know really latched onto it too. Damn. That's a that's that that's a lot of success, dude. I mean, just being from like a metalcore band. Yeah. That's, what 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 a trip, Tim. And then uh, we got the Powerless Rise again, like no, number ten on the Billboard. Bands like, you know, you kind of like look what other bands are doing. You kind of kind of peek in for a little minute. Like, wow, they're on the Billboard. What the fuck? Yeah. It's crazy, man. And yeah. so I mean, again, you had like the uh, like, like the same team. You know, mm-hmm. Adam D and uh, and Shadow the Colin, yeah, master mixer, dude, for sure. My my God, dude, how was that? Uh, how was it touring for that record? Um, which uh, are we talking about the follow up, the Powerless Rise, or yes? Uh, um, so that one was the first time I ever sensed that we like plateaued, but not necessarily like in a bad way, but that like okay, from Ocean Between Us to the Powerless Rise. We were headlining theaters and and they were you know mostly sold out everywhere and we did mm-hmm. the next record and oh here we were oh, okay this is like that to me started to feel like okay we're close closing in on like the ceiling for our genre you mm-hmm. know which is like a theater headliner yes um i mean it's really hard to picture our genre going ab- above theaters you have what like arenas i mean basically and it's yeah, like it's, yeah it's tough yeah it's like i don't really see you know our our band getting to that level and now you know, now some of the bands in our genre have actually done that, which is absolutely mind blowing. But um, yeah. that was the first time I saw like a plateau, and uh, which was cool for us to kind of recognize that like it doesn't matter how like you know how much we push for that like super radio friendly vibe, or if we just make the record like dark and 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 fast. Like, and so we just decided to make the Powerless Rise. Like, if you listen to the track listing, it's like you know it opens with essentially almost like a death metal type song, and and it's yeah. like very very aggressive for like a, a, rec- a record you hear in the top 10 and it's like well we our peers like atrey you and stuff like that had kind of gone the opposite direction where they almost went like purposefully very arena rock sounding to see if that could help them expand and i think yeah. maybe it did in the like screamo we crossover kind of thing but for us we're just like well like i want to see how big we could possibly be while not compromising at all on how heavy we are and that was like kind of the statement we made with that record it's great. I think that was accomplished. It's very, it's way more common for a band to change their sound for the wrong reasons. And it just doesn't, those, I guess, aspirations don't happen. Yeah. And know? by the way, I'm not saying, Trey, you changed it for the wrong reasons. I mean, yeah, Brandon, totally. he's an incredible vocalist and he probably just wanted to explore where he can go vocally. And I get it. We've know, all, yeah, we, we've all been there. We, uh, we put up a, a couple stinkers. It's fine. <laughs> oh no, but I, I just, yeah. you know, I, re- I recognize that our genre and all of our peers, we all went different directions. You guys all um, did in, in a crazy way. Yeah. Huh? Right around that time is when everybody sort of like, like polarized. And some bands that didn't work out and they went from, um, they previously were to some, like, there were bands we were neck and neck with for so many years. And yeah. um, sometimes there was like this unsaid sense of competition, you know? Of course. And then after that record, it was like, no, like, there's only like five of us that, that, that survived this whole thing that like are still headlining theaters. And, 
and everybody else that we were neck and neck with, like they're just back down to doing clubs. You know what I mean? And, wow. and it wasn't because like um, it, people were making wrong moves or it just like the genre like really took off. Mm-hmm. And then, like I said, it plateaued for a minute. And while that while that happened, it's like with every genre. Like when you look back at new metal, you know, there's five to ten bands tops that really can survive. Like the trends changing, and then everybody else kind of like just almost like disappeared. But those yeah. five bands, like regardless of um, you know how unpopular new metal got for a while, you know, you still had bands like Corn that would still do incredible numbers, even when new metal was like not cool. And now, obviously, it's cool again now. So I know, it's you know, weird. Full full circle. Yeah, it seems. It, it, it's really special when you get lucky enough to be in like you know that handful or two handfuls, and yeah. you you, you uh, transcend the uh, trends, yeah. you know, or maybe even like you're like you're as as you probably saw, like sometimes you go even down like a little bit, but but you had such like a big break. It says even go down a little bit, it's fine. Yeah, you of know? course. I mean, if you're playing for two thousand people and now you play for fifteen hundred people, I mean, you're still very fortunate. You that, know what I mean? That's so. a fucking dream for. I yeah. mean, most I mean, <laughs> most bands. Yeah, no, for sure. No matter, no matter in what in what fucking genre. But also a big change during that that album cycle was um, the emergence of uh, the deathcore genre, which you guys were obviously very foundational in. So like, the bands in our genre that were um, kind of like neck and neck with us, you know, our peers and stuff that that we started to separate from. Some of those bands were considered like the the heavy end of metalcore, and when deathcore came out, mm-hmm. it's like, oh, this, those dudes aren't even heavy anymore. You know what I mean? Like, oh yeah, yeah. So it's like that's a part of the reason I think you guys came in, and, and anybody who was like um, trying to be heavy but didn't really have like that, uh, I don't know, just that that magic to their songwriting. You know, mm-hmm. yeah. it was like, well, like here's the next generation, here we are. And not that you guys are even that much younger than us. It's just that mm-hmm. musically speaking, like metalcore and then deathcore. You know what I mean? It's just kind of those are the generations. You know, so. Yeah, it's crazy how long it took metalcore to be a thing, and I think yeah, you're right. The same thing happened for like deathcore. Once that came out, I was like, oh, that's that's just like the new, yeah, you know. And now I think what we're both experiencing, like you know, there's other, there's other versions now of metalcore, other versions of deathcore now in, in our in, uh, in this era. So it's so cool to see, man. Like what like like the bands that are younger and like oh, we listen to like you guys like you know, years. Yeah, it's, 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 it's really there's definitely cool. a second wave of of metalcore that's is very different, you know. Um, you know, you listen to like like Wage War as an example. They're considered a metalcore band, and you listen to Asley Dying, and we, we sound very different. And, you know, they're they're probably tuned like a fifth lower than we are. You know what I mean? And yeah, um, they have a whole modern twist to it. And so, like their fan base, um, their fan base might recognize our name, but they, you know, they're we're actually new to their fan base, and they're new yeah. to our fan base, and it's such a bizarre thing. You know? I know. It's it's like you're like it's this it's like it's like your guys without even trying are help helping each other. Yeah, you know it's cool. You learn when you get older. Like, man, why don't we just fucking help each other, man? For sure. You know, this is fucking build a whole genre as as big as big as we can because no one could do it alone. You know. Yeah. Yeah, and then uh, well, now we're at uh, Awakened. You know, um, it sounds uh, very similar to like 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 the last record. I, I could get, being in like a, that kind of being having some experience in a heavily touring band like you. After your fourth record, you get kind of fucking tired, you know. Like it seems like you're just trying to fucking power through. Yeah, you know. Well, I think when we wrote Awakened, um, the internal communication for us was the most separated. Not because we were like really had like a lot of fights or anything like that. It's just kind of like, a, um, you know, we had gotten to the point where we we're like emailing each other back and forth demos instead of getting together in a oh. rehearsal space. And um, you know, like I tracked vocals at my my own studio while the rest of the guys went out to Colorado to track the rest of everything. And it was just kind of like, we started to kind of, um, feel like we were like coasting because, you know, we've done this so many times. It's like, all right, well we can just, you know, let's each do our own, let's each do this, how we prefer individually instead of like coming together as a, as a unit. Uh, and I still think the record came out great. I'm still really uh, proud of it, but, um, that was kind of the beginning of us, like each kind of individually living in our own worlds. And that yeah. would not even just me, but I mean, all five of us. And, and that kind of stuck for a long time. Like, regardless of my arrest, which was shortly after Awakened, um, everybody kind of started just to like, you know, whatever personality traits they had that were the strongest, they kind of withdrew into those and became their own individual. Um, and there really wasn't a sense of like, in the earlier days, you know, uh, for better or worse, like, a lot of bands allow uh, somebody to have a position of leadership to sort of be like, hey, I think from a big picture strategy standpoint, this is where the ship is going, right? And, um, you know, I, I didn't do that anymore, and nobody else really uh, picked that picked up the reins on that either, and so we just kind of 
just kind of spread out, you know? Yeah, you need that leadership, you know? What, mm -hmm. Why do you think that happened? Um, I think that um, I was in a really comfortable place in life and just became interested in, um, you know, like I got really, really into fitness, but obviously in like an unhealthy kind of mindset and, and mm -hmm. just like other hobbies in my life, um, you know, like I, I was single for a little while and was like interested in, you know, just like dating and like all that kind of stuff again for the first time in a very, very long time. And so I think just mentally, um, like I was just like, ah, oh, like this, this ship just sort of seems to be going, it, it just seems to be coasting. Everything has kind of plateaued and there's like, I don't want to put like a lot of stress into it cause it just kind of, it does what it does. You know, we have band management and everything just is going to just, whether I, whether I steal, steer the ship personally or not, it's, it's going somewhere. And so I might as well just do the things that I personally enjoy. Yeah. And I, I kind of withdrew into like more of a selfish mindset. Yeah, it sounds like, yeah, that, that selfish mindset kind of, how, during exactly that, that time period, was it like, how, how old were the guys and how old were you? Um, I was 32 at the time. Um, I think when it, when it came out, I was 31 and then shortly turned 32. Oh, dude, late 20s, early 30s suck. Like everyone, especially when you're in a band, everyone's going through your life at their own pace. And, and whatever they are, they just kind of go deeper in, into that. It's yeah. nuts, dude. And, well, it's uh, like we're not kids. It's like who are our adult identities, you know? Uh, yeah. And, and we, like, f were arrogant enough to think, oh, I got it all figured out, so I know who I want to be as an adult. But there's still, mm -hmm. you know, some uh, some testing the waters to figure out, you know? Yeah, man, it's it sucks, dude. And, and from a from an outsider perspective, looking in, it kind of seems also you're like struggling with like you know what do I believe as far as like religion and spirituality. Like it seems like you're like I mean, hence like the record's called Awaken. You know what does Awaken mean to you? Yeah, and it was uh, like on the nose for, for me. Like I wasn't trying to hide anything. I, I tried to make the album title very much on the nose a lot of the lyrics were very much mm -hmm. like easy to there, there's a poetic nature to the way i try to write lyrics because you know mm -hmm. otherwise um they shouldn't you know i think lyrics should always have a poetic nature to them but yes. but I, I wanted to make sure anybody reading it could be like oh i'm pretty sure i know what he's talking about here and um you know i had i had spent all my 20s um very very involved in like christian theology uh i i was uh um I was actually like a theology student. Uh, philosophy and religious studies was was a bachelor's degree I got, and so mm -hmm. the previous year before Awakened, I had finished my degree um, in religious studies, and during that process of trying to like defend that point of view, which was the primary reason that I, I like dug so deeply into it, mm -hmm. I realized like I can't in good conscience defend some of these beliefs because. Uh, you know, I know too much now, you know what I mean? And yeah. it was like this kind of, um, okay, well, this reshapes what it is that I believe. And I, I think looking back, um, there's that shock of my whole moral system being built on because God told me so. Mm -hmm. And then not, oh, if, if that's not the case, then like, what do I build my life on now? And I feel like that's, that's actually a dangerous thing about somebody who grows up entirely like too religious, so to speak, is that their whole framework is based off of because God told me so. Um, but there are actually great other reasons to, uh, you know, to have morality. And so for me, like if I were to describe it now, I, I'm not like anti-spiritual now or anything like that. In fact, like um, with a lot of people who are Christians, they say to me, you know, oh, you know, what do we believe? And I say, you might not consider me a Christian, but I think we're on the same team with a lot of these things. Like I don't think we're actually as far apart as you th as you might think we are. Yes. Um, and what I consider myself or what somebody else might consider me, like I don't even get into those those terms. It's just like mm -hmm. foundationally, I think that we've all suffered and felt pain, and if we don't want that in our lives, you know, we should be able to uh, say to another person, like, "Hey, how can I help you like prevent this suffering in your life?" You know, like that, that true like deep compassion. That's one of the things I think incarceration does for people um, that are at least able to be mindful of that. Is they say, "Hey, like I've caused other people a lot of pain." I'm in here feeling a lot of pain because of how separated I am from my loved ones in society. I don't, I don't want anybody else to have to experience this kind of pain. I don't ever want to inflict that kind of pain on somebody else. And it's really that, um, just that sense of compassion that I think morality can be built off of. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, if somebody wants to, in addition to that, say, you know, and, and I believe, you know, that, that God, um, 
God wants us to live this way. You know, I believe that when Jesus talked about serving the poor and the orphans and um, visiting people in prisons, I, I think he was talking about the outcasts of society and helping them. And like those kinds of principles are really beautiful once you also understand your own individual um, suffering and pain process and how that, yes. that, that should really be the driving force. Yes, and we all, we all have a different process too. Yeah. And especially when you're, I mean, and for people that don't know, you weren't, you're not dabbing and being a Christian. You like, as you said, you did, you studied it. Yeah. And, and then you have this whole new, like you have a very wide uh, perspective, you know, and uh, that's a, that's also like, again, like late, late twenties, really, that, that's a hard age. And then when your whole, basically like, maybe like you could say, like your whole foundation is like, well, who am I now? If I, if I don't, I don't believe this. And then you have a record record called Awaken. Yeah. You know, it's like, that's a, that's a struggle, man. And, that, and I could only assume that it just makes you feel very alone. And then when you're, when you're in a band, i um, trying to uh, explain this. Uh, when the only few people in your life that uh, start to do this, uh, it sounds like, you know, you're just making a record, but when that happens, it, it, and it's, it's, it's happened to me, so you feel very alone yeah and you uh you do go to pretty dark places which i i personally have you know like because i mean your whole especially if you're dealing with like abandonment issues when your band goes like this it's not you you go into other things and it sounds like you know you were struggling with uh finding sp spirituality after you know this doing the studying of being of being a christian and then now you're as, as you said you like you, you get have you get you start doing things in an unhealthy way for you. You seem to really pick up bodybuilding. And me being outside, I'm like, dude, Tim's getting big. Like, well, I, I, I could tell. Yeah. You know, like you start, you, it turns into like a addiction and then you don't have your fucking foundation. You don't have your spiritual foundation and then you don't have your band foundation, which is yeah. even just as strong as being spiritual because you're, you're bounded by, by music and, and, and your soul. So I, I can only imagine like, you know, where did your... So obviously you're you're in bodybuilding. Uh, you're uh, trying to figure out who you are. Like, where was your mind at, Tim? Where like, you know, you're, like like you're going to to the gym. Like, like you're you barely put out this fucking record, which I I, I know how that is. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then to you being incarcerated. Like, what like what was what was your thought process like? Um, I mean, there's a lot of different eras there so i mean leading up to my incarceration um you know when when my world sort of fell apart like you know um you have this person you talk to every day you know uh so, some people say it's god you know i mean other mm -hmm. another religion might have a different name for it you know whatever and some of you wake up and you spend however many minutes or hours in the morning talking to this person and all of a sudden this mm -hmm. person is not a part of your life anymore so you like lost your your little like like best friend mm -hmm. you know and then you've also i've also lost that deep connection with my bandmates and I went through a divorce and mm -hmm. you know, everything was changing in my life. Um, and what I didn't know what was really important to me at that time, but I think, and, and some of the stuff I'm not even really able to, to technically talk about. So, uh, I'll just say it, say it in these terms that for any person who's, let's just say a person is a father and they're, they're confused about what really matters to them in life. Mm -hmm. It becomes obvious to them that, Everything else in their life can change, but being a father is still their identity. It's still what's most important to them. Mm -hmm. And so a father's relationship with his children, if everything else in his life changes and goes away, that's the one thing he wants to protect above all things. Mm -hmm. And so my mindset was, I don't care what changes or goes differently in my life, but I want to maintain what's most important to me mm -hmm. and almost like the singular fixation on on what was most important to me, regardless of how that affected anything else in the world. Yeah. I mean, I know it's a little bit vague, but that's the best I can really talk about it. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, obviously fast forward, you know, I mean, shit like all we have as outsiders is what we see on, on TV. Yeah. You're like the person that we least expected. I've shared a bus with you in all, all over Europe, damn near across the ocean and, and world. You know I, I know, I know who you are, Tim, and I had uh, great moments with you. So I'm like, I'm sitting back with my parents, I'm watching national television. There's, and there's Tim. And depending on, obviously no matter, only you fucking know what exactly would happen in like a very tight circle. But, 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 but when, when you're an outsider, 
there is different mindsets that that you could approach that is you know okay he he fucked up or you know what's what's wrong with tim yeah. you know i i saw uh I, you know I, I just saw like a dude in his early 30s and he was broken for all all the reasons that you just pretty much laid out on, on the table very 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 clearly and people could go listen to this whole thing again and listen i mean it's very clear you were very alone and we're an outside i'm like man what what happened to tim like like, like holy shit but i knew i knew who you who you were just based on the time I spent with you. You know, I, I, I've had a long thought process before this conversation, exactly what I, I, I think of you, which why, you know, we're, you know, we're, we're uh, talking. And that was like, what was like, Tim, like, what was that like, man? I mean, I never been incarcerated. Like, like, what, what, like what, what was that like for you? Yeah. I mean, I think that my, my thinking was so, isolated into my own mind and like disconnected from um my support system that i i didn't really even fathom or realize how much i had lost myself and and who the core of who i really was like you know it's like i was this one person for most of my life and then and then for this period of time um you know i had this very isolated different type of mindset and then and then Mm -hmm. have since returned to being you know much of who i was the um earlier part of my life, plus, of course, the added perspective of everything I went through. But mm-hmm. when I lost um, my sense of, like, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know really how, how to describe it other than to say, like, I, I, I lost myself. I lost my way. And I sat there in a cell being like, how did I become this person? This is, like, it, like, kind of blew my own mind. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. um and it's like as as the mental cloud kind of like the fog like went away and I, and I could see clearly it's just like there's so obviously a thousand better ways that I could have, um, you know, gone through a divorce or a thousand better ways that if I wanted to be, you know, close with my family or if I felt mm-hmm. that, that burning of a father who felt, you know, I think I, I can talk about, vaguely speaking, you know, any father who loses his children, there's a burning feeling of just like, you know, I'll do anything to fix this or to make this right or to maintain this relationship, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but just because you feel like you would be willing to do anything to um, to maintain what matters to you the most in the world mm-hmm. doesn't mean that you should or those are your best options. And it's so clearly sitting there thinking in a cell like, wow, I could have handled this a thousand different ways. And like the fact that in my mindset, I thought at the time this was the best way to handle the situation. Like it blew my own mind. It's like, how, how did I even think that? Like, and it, it just was shocking, you know? Um, and there's really no defense or no way to, to, to take away what I did other than that, you know, thankfully n- there was actually no true uh, physical harm of any kind, you know? And, and I think that, um, and knowing that I have, I'm relatively young, I have the rest of my life to, to demonstrate to myself beyond other people, um, you know, that that is a very isolated, dark thought process in my life. And if that mm-hmm. is an isolated, dark thought process over the course of 30, 40, 50 years, you'll, you'll see that. But I can't prove that to anybody, you know, coming out of prison, be like, hey, guys, I'm changed. I'm, I'm, I'm good. You know, like, yes. you know, they have to say, hey, here, here's who you were for 32 years. Here's this this dark period of your life, and here's who you are for the next twenty. I, I have I have tw- at least twenty years till most people in this world are willing to be like, you know what? Maybe maybe he really did change. Maybe incarceration really did like in one of those rare instances where incarceration actually helped an individual. You know, yeah. maybe I'm one of those rare cases. You know, but I have twenty years to prove that, and so I'm not in a rush other than to be myself and let people see that slowly over time. And um, yeah, I mean, I, mean I, I I hate talking about it in any kind of contextual way because I feel like it might come across like I'm giving excuses. I'm not. I'm just telling people the context under which these things happened. That's it. Yeah. And uh, it's such a, a, a terrible time for you because you you're, you were already, it seems like you didn't have a foundation like you could talk to someone to help you with, with, with your thought process. Is And um, now like you are you have no choice but, but to be alone with yourself. You're literally in a fucking cell. I mean, it's mm-hmm. all, all you have is you and your feelings and your thoughts and all your unprocessed feelings you have when you're five years old, and like you, all, this all all you have. So there's there's plenty of time to 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 process stuff. Um, like, were you thinking about your 
your band members and what and what and what they were dealing with? Um, I mean, I did spend a lot of time before my sentencing uh, trying to communicate with them to some degree to say, hey, guys, mm -hmm. like I won't be able to communicate when I'm gone, but I, I, I can communicate now. I, I'd love to sit down face to face with you guys and talk. Mm -hmm. um, there was a brief conversation that I had with with Jordan during that time. And, uh, you know, it was very, during a very like traumatic time where it was just like an emotional sort of like blur to me. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was very short. And, um, you know, so I'm not saying that there was absolutely no communication at all. Uh, there w there was, uh, I mean, I, I actually, I couldn't even tell you the conversation because it was it was pretty short. And it was like right after some of the events while I was on house arrest waiting uh, um, my sentencing and stuff. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I think the the essence of, of what he wanted to say was, hey, I showed up. Like, I don't have anything to say. I don't even really know how to process this. But I showed up to, like, you know, to be here for a second. And mm -hmm. and then after that, he he never really talked to me uh, ever again, um, <laughs> including largely after my incarceration when we were p performing together as a band. We never really, you know, ad addressed or talked about it between him and I, you know. And so it's weird. After all these years, I haven't talked to Jordan in um, – like over over a couple of years now, um, and I think in the aftermath of that, he's like, I want to perform in the band again, but I think when it actually came time to it, I don't I don't know if he knew how to process not just things with me, but just so many things in his life. And um, some people's um, trauma response is to shut down, and they just mm -hmm. they just avoid, you know. And I think that's largely been his response. And other people. Uh, um, you know, they, they, they call it like anxious attachment where they just like, they want to talk about it constantly. And I'm, mm. I'm probably more so closer to that side to where it's like, uh, I'm never afraid to talk about something. I may stumble on my words. I may not have, I may not even be able to articulate perfectly, but I will keep trying and trying and trying, you know? And so we were very, very different in that regard. Yeah. I mean, yeah, your, your band just became more of, of how they, yeah, everyone, especially processing like, like that. So some something so bizarre, yeah. They're just gonna. I mean, the only thing you could, they could really do is like, okay, we're just not gonna talk to him. But obviously, there is there is some uh, there is a point where like they started to come back around, yeah. you know. And, and and how and how was that for for you? Well, so for me, it was a different story with everybody. And I'll just give two very polar opposite examples. Jordan's whole thing was to be avoidant, you know, to like if I. Mm -hmm. After my incarceration, um, I spent a year working as a case manager at an addiction treatment facility, mm -hmm. um, doing group therapy as well and stuff like that. And during that time, I reached out to Jordan many times. I'd reach out to him. Um, like two and a half months later, he'd say, oh, by the way, I got your message uh, just calling you calling you back. But then we wouldn't really talk. <laughs> it's so, mm -hmm. so weird. It's a really weird avoidant situation where I'm just like, I don't know where he sits. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you had uh, Phil, who's a very direct communicator, and I never have to worry about him, um, you know, being mysterious. He just said to me, hey, dude, I just want to let you know that, like, when I think about you and what you've gone through, um, I'm really saddened by it and I'm, I'm embarrassed to be associated with you. And, you know, that's not something I'm sure that I can get ever get past. And that was the first conversation Phil had with me when I, you know, when I reached out to him after my incarceration. And I said, dude, thank you so much for being so direct because that is the – that is the best way you can handle the situation from my perspective as somebody who's yes. not avoidant. Mm -hmm. And I said, if, if we have any hope of working through this, like we'll work through it. And if it doesn't, it doesn't work. Like, like I know where you stand, you know? And so, mm -hmm. um, he, he, when he said that to me, he wasn't ready to talk. And he said, you know, I'll, I'll let you know in the future if I am. And, you know, six months later, however many months later, he said, okay, I'm, I'm willing to sit down and have lunch with you. I, no promises, nothing, but just I'll have lunch with you. And we sat down, we had lunch and then we talked a little bit more, and again, he said, yeah, I still have a lot of hard feelings to work through, like, um, and here they are, A, B, C, D, E, F, you know, like, just listed them out, and we were able to talk about them, and that was healing, you know? Um, and we still weren't like, all right, let's get together and play music again, but that was, like, a step toward healing, and I think healing needs to happen regardless of uh, if I play music with anybody, you know? So, mm -hmm. um, to some degree, I would say to Jordan, like, hey, dude, regardless of, of our past as musicians, just as two human beings, like, you know, the conversations that can happen that can help us heal, I think, are really, are really beneficial for both of us, even outside the world of music. You know, and so, um, anyway, those are two like different examples. The other guys kind of sat somewhere in between, um, and I think it's totally fine to 
Phil, Phil had enough conversations with me and he said, hey, I've worked through a lot of my feelings. Um, you know, I'm ready to do this. And uh, I think it's totally fine for some of the other guys to say that, you know, like where Nick sat essentially is that um, I've gotten all my feelings out and I still don't feel better. Mm -hmm. I still don't feel like I, I fully have uh, a, a connection and a trust with you. And I may never, ever gain that. And so the interaction between us is always going to have tension to it forever. So I just don't think this is a good situation for us. And I respect that. You know, there's nothing wrong with that either. And so each of the guys, when I came back, had to do whatever was right for them. Yeah. And uh, eventually you did, uh, you did eventually come to an agreement that, okay, we're all going to sit down and talk. Yeah. You know, yeah. and, uh, you know, that was, that was rough to watch because you could just see like, like the hurt. Yeah. You see how hurt yeah. everybody is. Yeah. I mean, and Nick is just on, this is on his face. And, uh, and I think me and Phil have a lot in common and I could tell how hurt he was just by looking at him only because I, I, he's like, we're both like guitar players and we have a certain deep connection with, with our singers and stuff. I, I could kind of tell like you're, like you're definitely the most effect, uh, affected, you know, but it's crazy. You guys all <laughs> sat and talked. It's, yeah. it's, it's crazy. We, and we hadn't uh, done the album at that point. We hadn't worked out all the details. We just, you know, we felt like there was some criticism from people saying, hey, it's weird to me that you guys just put out one song and then didn't address the elephant in the room. And we said, mm -hmm. well, dude, we don't know how to do it. Like, there's not like a statement we can give as a band. So yes. we're just going to put a camera up, you know. It's like very emotional to think back on. But it's like, you know, we're just going to be raw because healing takes a lot of years. It takes years, man. You're right. You know, for for all the guys and you, and you have this all this history with each other you know you got you guys you're were best friends at some point you know just 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 playing music and now and now you're at a table just like talk like talking about something that raw and crazy yeah i think there's a certain expectation of people when they come out of incarceration you put them in a very very traumatic situation and you say all right i want you to go be locked up and treated like an animal for you know three years in state prison and then i want you to come out and just just act and be and convince everybody close to you that you are healed in every single way. And it's like, that's not possible. You know, like, I'm not going to sit here before my bandmates and say, hey, guys, I did my time. And because I did my time, I'm healed in every single possible way. I have no more kinks to work out in my life. Like, that's just not, the, our, our system is not rehabilitative, you know. So mm -hmm. rehabilitation is possible, but it's from mm -hmm. the love of um, friends and family and people who are close. And that's why, you know, I'm really big uh, into the post incarceration process i have you know i work with a nonprofit that i help help co-found because of that um because i think that's where the rehabilitation really truly begins is not until somebody's actually out on parole wow yeah yeah we, we don't really know what that process is mm -hmm. you know how like uh like, like the success rate is so low when someone gets out of prison and like it's so low and you i'm mean, you've probably been talking to people and and, and working with people about that yeah. You know, and uh, you're kind of, I um, mean, Tim, you're a very rare case, you know. I mean, there's there's guys, you know, that, that will struggle in the system their whole lives. You know, there's the, you know, two thirds recidivism rate of guys that are going to end up going back. Mm -hmm. um, and the irony of, of those statistics is that because of those statistics, um, you know, we think that that everybody is a repeat offender, but it actually goes into classifications of like what type of crime it was and all these types of things. Yes. Um, you know, and then, so then with California, as an example, we have overpopulated prisons. And so the federal government mandated that California lower the prison population to be more humane, uh, incarceration conditions. And so they said, oh, well, you know, we're going to take people that uh, have repeat drug offenses and we're going to like, like lower their sentence and let them out sooner because those are just smaller, more minor offenses. And, and they are actually, I mean, and mm -hmm. I, I'm actually in support of reshaping the way we handle, um, drug related cases in our country mm -hmm. but in terms of statistically by far the most likely to reoffend so that's where some of those two-thirds numbers come from right two-thirds of people are going to go back or be rearrested mm -hmm. but when you take a case like mine the statistical likelihood of there ever being a reoffense in, in the entire lifetime of an individual is you know it's it's, uh, it's amongst the absolute lowest so we're not mm -hmm. actually talking about like apples to apples when we talk about these kinds of things yes but i understand that i'm still lumped in with that crowd of of just overall the over umbrella of of incarcerated individuals you know and so yeah um 
you know, if you have somebody who comes from a gang li- gang life background and you put them right back out in the same community they came from, they're more scared of their the big homie in their neighborhood than they are of the cops. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I mean, if if I grew up in, you know, like a lot of the the Mexican gang guys that I, I played basketball with, right? Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of those guys when they get back on the street, like whoever the big dog in their neighborhood was calling the shots, if he said, hey, I need you to go rob this liquor store and you don't go rob that liquor store, you are in way more trouble than if you get caught by the cops. You know what I mean? So yeah. like it's a tough situation. So th- that's where a lot yeah. of recidivism comes from. Wow. Well, okay, so now we're, uh, you know, you guys have the discussion, you know, at, at what point we're like, okay, that we're going to, let's, you know, play we're going to play music. Let's, let's actually do like a record. Um, so we originally got back together and said, let's do one song and just see if it feels right or not. Mm -hmm. And we did my own grave. And, um, that song not only, um, like was very successful, like commercially, but it was really easy to write. It was like, it just came out. It was just, um, you know, there wasn't, there wasn't like negative creative tension. I tried mm-hmm. things for the first time ever that I'd never done in my whole life. Uh, I, I've always written as Dying lyrics and just when I was done, I was done and I put them on the record. Mm-hmm. I sent the lyrics to everybody before I was finished with them and said, hey guys, here's what I want to write about. This is what, what the song is and like, go ahead and mm-hmm. take a look at it. You know, if there's yeah. if there's things you think I should change, like let me know. That was like a vulnerable new place for me. I'd never done that with a, with a song um, mm-hmm. before. And so it just it just came out and it felt good. And then we said, okay, let's, let's do... Uh, another batch of songs and then we'll work towards, you know, eventually doing a record and everything felt good. And so musically everything felt good. But I think that, um, the aftermath of that, it's like, okay, while we're working on music, that feels good, you know, but Mm -hmm. when we've got to talk about, um, you know, just practical things like living on the road together and, and, and oddly enough, like I, I wasn't really the person that was particularly difficult to live with on the road. Like I, I, you know, I just like, Hey, does my microphone work? Like, I don't, you know, I don't need a special tech. I don't need like, yeah. I don't need all, you know, special backstage things. I just like, yeah. can I get some water, preferably not cold, and a yeah. microphone that works? And, um, but there are tensions that happen on the road uh, with other members, and if you add those tensions to also things unresolved with with me, it's like we can be distracted working on the music for a while, and that that gives us something positive to sink our teeth into. But that doesn't mean that, you know all the members have overcome their feelings towards my past and what, what I put them through. Mm-hmm. And so I caused them a lot of pain that they're still dealing with. And then on top mm-hmm. of that, they have the new pains of, of just little minor things that all bands butt heads with on the road. You know what I mean? And, yeah. and, um, you know, I thought that, that, um, in the case of, of Nick, that's, you know, I, I can't speak for him, but I think to some degree you put all that together and it's just like, you know, guys, this seemed like a great idea at first, but it's just, it's just not the right fit for me. And I think there's, a lot to respect about that. It's just him saying, I tried, I put forth all my effort to like want mm-hmm. to make this work. And it now that I've like explored it for a year, it just isn't really what I want. And that's, you know, I, I respect that like a lot. I don't think there needs to be, um, you know, this this narrative uh, sometimes people want to say is that if a guy leaves a band, it's because they hate each other or something yeah. like that. You know what I mean? No, I, I think, I think that he has things between him and I that are unresolved that he, you know, may need to face, whether it's, with me directly or in his personal therapy or like whatever whatever it is and i have things that i need to address but like those aren't because we hate each other those are just because it's it's a very complex situation and healing like i mentioned before it just takes it takes years it's not something you can like fast track yeah it, it, it takes years i mean um you know I, and uh you guys you know came back and uh you have like your first show in san diego sold out in minutes you know, i mean you put out this song that's still, still like your number one stream song yeah. It's, it's it's I mean as you say it was a commercial success massive song um and you know, I watched all your tour vlogs you guys went to you know I'm not sure where you guys did this you guys went to Asia first yeah. Yeah. which it, for those those of you watching listening that's it's the most rewarding it's fun but it's a very grueling schedule. I'm not sure why you guys did that first. <laughs> but, no no but, that's that's the first like uh vlogs that we that we did but we that okay. was actually um that was actually our last thing we did before the pandemic. So, so oh, okay, the, great. Yeah, okay, great. So we had the most footage of that to put together. Good, you know. Good. I'm like, why, why are they doing that first? That's, that that schedule is fucking nuts, dude. <laughs> no, no, no. Oh, holy shit! <laughs> I mean, from an outsider, it looks like it looked like you guys were having a good time. Yeah, and there, there were good times, and there's still. 
I, I don't look back on the the when I say the classic lineup reunion tour, right? As an or if, if that's what you want to call it, I don't look on, back on that with any sort of uh, animosity or frustration. I, I recognize mm-hmm. that you know um, everybody tried in their own way to like make that work the best that they could, and really, any, I, one thing also another misconception is that is that um, you know the other guys that, that left it was it was related to that. It's actually uh, Nick left related to some of the original unresolved things between myself or between him and Phil or between him and what, and he can only speak for that himself. Like Mm -hmm. just things that he felt like, you know what guys, I tried, this just wasn't a good fit for me. But then the other guys, um, uh, when the pandemic started, Jordan just sort of like went into isolation and that's not an uncommon, uh, coping thing, you know, for, for people out there. So I'm not talking trash anyway. That's just how he chose to handle it Mm -hmm. is just to isolate, cut himself off, really not communicate. And after a couple of years of not communicating, which is really going into the pandemic, um, Jordan was excited about future tours. Um, you know, if we were going to work on for future singles, we weren't, we weren't quite ready for a new album yet. We we're like, oh, let's do some future singles. Let's do some special releases. He was on board with all that kind of stuff. Everything he was on board with, and he was actually kind of taking the reins on like, oh, I want to help out more with like the band's merch and blah, blah, blah. And then the pandemic hit and, you know, people were in a different emotional space than they were. And I don't know, mm-hmm. it could be coincidence or not, but like, you know, a month or so into that, he just shut off communication. And that's really like where that comes from. And that's not that's not related. He wasn't um, coming to us saying like, I have unresolved tension and I, I don't like this band. Like it, there was never an argument. There was never any of that. It's just when mm-hmm. you don't talk to somebody for more than two years, you just kind of move forward, you know, right? So like that's that's a Man. different situation. And then the last one was Josh, who just wanted to play with Spirit Box. And he said, you know, I helped help them work on some new songs and I just really had a good time. And I feel like they they asked me if I would do some tours with them. They conflict with the Aslo Dying schedule. I can't really do both. And I just, I want to go do this. It sounds fun to me. And I said, dude, like, I want you to be happy. Like, mm-hmm. like how, how could I not, like, I'm, first of all, he's not asking my permission, you know what I mean? Yeah. But uh, you know, how could I not be happy? How could I not, like, be in approval of that? Yeah. Yeah, it's not, uh, everyone went their own direction, it yeah. sounds like, you know, especially after, like, a pandemic. Yeah. You know, like, you're, everyone's going to take that. As, man, that, yeah, your situation is so complex, and then you throw on, a, hey, it's going on a pandemic. Yeah, and, yeah. and I think that when you look at the catalog of music we have, Phil and I are the most uniquely connected overall. Josh was also a songwriter, so um, if there was a songwriting trio, it would be... Um, Phil, Josh, and I, but Josh didn't start writing until after An Ocean Between Us because that was already recorded, and yeah, mm-hmm. I even wrote the melodies on that um, yes. and everything. So if you look at the catalog as a whole, Phil and I are the most uniquely connected to that because we're responsible mm-hmm. for almost everything in that catalog, right? And, yes. and and so you look at the future of our band, and it's like, well, who's going to who's gonna look at the future and look back at the past and just like have the most attachment to this? It's the guys that created it the most. Yes. You know? And, and that's, that's really where Phil and I are as like, friends and then guys running a business together technically speaking it's like hey dude like let's just like have good communication let's just enjoy the process like write songs you know be able to celebrate for the first time ever go play a large festival like i mentioned earlier like a vakin festival mm-hmm. be able to be on stage be like wow look at what this catalog has given us this opportunity to play for these crowds you know on another continent like yeah that's something that phil and i did this past summer that that we've just never done and it's it's a uh, it feels good to be connected to that and not just be connected to that alone. Like it's, it's Phil and I together. Yeah. You guys have so much history and it's really cool to see Phil like just work out. I mean, that's, that's stuff you only do alone. So the fact he did like the work alone, mm-hmm. you know, handle process feelings, whatever you had to process and just grow, you know, yeah. and be able to, to talk with you after such a, like a traumatic time, you know, it's, that's a pretty special guy, man. Yeah. And, th- and there's a, a common thread between Phil and I, um, there's not, uh, I, I don't actually know for each of the guys individually, um, but I, I do know that this is common for Phil and I, that we both are big fans of, of therapy and whether, I don't know if Phil's, um, that's obviously like a very sensitive subject. I'm not going to get into whatever he, I don't know if he goes weekly or if he goes once a month or whatever, but, mm-hmm. but he, he at least recognizes the value of it and has, yeah. has brought up the value of it. And we've done, uh, therapy sessions together to like talk about some of the stuff that, you know, Phil and I want to work through mm-hmm. and we, we believe in that process. And so, uh, it, it fits in line with his like non-avoidance, you know, his just like, oh, yeah. I'm going to say what's on my mind. We either work through it or we don't, but at least it's out there. Right. You know, so um, we, we share that. And uh, I, I think as somebody like previously incarcerated that, um, I mean, that's absolutely mandatory for anybody who's been through 
when you incarcerate an individual, you're not sending them to go, you know, um, just think about your thoughts in a cell and just, you know, be able to focus. No, like you're, you're, you know, you're worried about your, your physical safety at times, you're emotionally distressed being, uh, torn away from your family and everybody. Um, you know, you're treated by the correctional average correctional officer treats you like less than human. You know what I mean? Like, you know, just total disdain for your existence. You know what I mean? It is the opposite of a therapeutic environment. So I think that coming out of incarceration, you're, you're subjecting people to a new form of trauma in addition to whatever trauma was in their background that led them to the unclear thinking, you know, that, that was part of their crime. And so mm-hmm. I'm, a, I'm a big believer that um, people that were previously incarcerated need to be in ongoing therapy. Um, and then I, I want to express to the public that when you incarcerate an individual, and, and some people believe all these guys deserve this, so I'm not saying this is an oh, poor me situation, but you're not just saying, hey, I want you to be out of the public eye for three years or, or whatever. You're saying, I want you to go in there and witness your friends getting stabbed. I want you to go in there and, and, and be mandatorily required to participate in riots. I want you to go in there and, you know, basically have uh, just a roller coaster of different things that you go through in addition to being locked away from the rest of the world for a few years. And that's something that if we're going to do that to people, at least recognize that's what we're doing to them. Let's not just like pretend that we just, you know, we're just going to send this guy on vacation for a few years. No, no, we, we sentence them to all these other unofficial things that aren't part of the true sentencing. And if we're going to give them those, those parts of the sentence, let's give them something in the aftermath to make them productive members of society again. Yeah. Yeah. The people have no idea what, like, what goes on there. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a, it's like a weird, a weird thing, you know, like, you know, people, obviously you have a complex situation and like you didn't go to the, like a cancellation you went to like people like wanting to like anni- annihilate you mm-hmm. like but it's just like but that makes no sense because okay like let's say someone thinks tim is a bad person okay cool like like they're right but then you want them to go through that what kind of person does that make you yeah you know it's like it's like this it doesn't really make any sense well and you know? and, and i understand there's people that you know hey you deserve worse than the sentence you got. I actually understand that perspective because I, when I look back at the person I was for that period of my life, that dark path that I went down, I don't like that person either, right? So I don't mm-hmm. look back on that person fondly and think like, oh, let's just have compassion and like, yeah. let's just give that guy an easy sentence, right? And some mm-hmm. people say, oh, well, you know, he only did three years in state prison. He should have done, you know, more than 10. Sure. And it's like, okay, I understand that. But like when my release date was was given to me, I wasn't going to go to the gate and be like, you know what, um, I'm going to make the rest of society happy. So, you know what, just go ahead and cancel my release date. I'm going back in. Like, that's just, that's, that's yeah. not where I'm at as a person. You know, I'm thinking, okay, if I want to undo some of the hurt that, that I've caused, mm-hmm. the best way I can do that is by becoming a productive member of society and moving forward from this, mm-hmm. help, healing myself and helping other people in the process, you know. And I think yes. that I've shown that, um, hey, I don't spend – you know, 80 hours a week working for my nonprofit. So I'm not going to try to like be um, insincere, but I do spend weekly time working for the nonprofit that I helped uh, start. And I do personally just help other people off the record, you know, just like situations where it's like these guys were previously incarcerated and I want to help them heal and become productive members of society. And so yeah, I think that I'm showing slowly over time that I'm the real deal. And if somebody doubts that, that's fine. It's very reasonable to doubt like, oh, he's just saying that because he wants a chance to play music again or he's just doing that. Whatever whatever they think my motivation is, that's fine. Just they got to sit back and watch and see what happens in 20 years, right? You know I mean? That's really all I can really do. Yeah. Um, and it's crazy. Like it must be such a, a trip for you because then you come out and then you're hanging out with uh, – the guys in the band again and then like the fan base like welcome you guys that was, shocked all of us yeah uh, like i was like it was fucking massive dude like like the shows all over the country but we're just selling out I'm like damn they're like like the fans to me i'm always like the fans have to stay mm-hmm. you know and like uh if, if your fans welcomed you and obviously i mean just look i mean you, you, you can't lie about about those numbers N- numbers don't lie and seeing how stoked pe- pe- people were like like see you guys i'm like damn that's fucking nuts dude yeah. Like, like I, I assume you guys were just shocked. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think the proof of how shocked we were is that the original rooms that we announced were uh, 500 cap rooms. 
roughly speaking, you know, 500, 700, you know, some of the smaller cities down to like even 300. Cause we thought mm -hmm. this is an intimate, like reintroduction to the, to the public. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, those got upgraded one time to, to, you know, a thousand cap venues. And they said, okay, well, we'll basically double the size. And they got upgraded again to a thousand. And then, and then at that point, those sold out within another week. And some of the shows we played in, in Germany are for our first tour back were literally 4,500 people as a headliner in Germany. And we'd previously never really headlined for more than like 3,000. You know what I mean? So what? it was like this like wow. insane process where every few weeks we were changing the venue. And I mean, I have no idea logistically how that even worked. Our booking agent is, is a miracle worker because he was able to switch venues. Um, you know, and, and in the post post COVID world, I mean, you couldn't get venue holds like that anymore. So it was a, I know I mean, yeah. all, all of these weird little things dude. like yeah. the fact that it like worked out that way. How was that for, for you? I mean, you has, I mean, to have a point in your life where you're like so isolated and then now you're, you're out and like this, get this, massive woke massive welcome from people like all over yeah. the world essentially well and it's different for each country because i think that within germany or mainland europe as a whole their mindset is we we hate what tim did mm -hmm. but we believe that he's done his time mm -hmm. and he appears to you know to be on a good path now and unless he shows us a reason to doubt that we're going to give him a second chance because they have this you've done your time mentality right mm -hmm. and and in the U.S., we're a little bit more, um, you know, there's a little bit more, like, peer pressure around, like, the concepts of, like, virtue signaling and, like, you mm -hmm. know, like, yes. oh, like, you supported this. That that mean, that implies about you because you went to the Azledon concert. That implies that you have poor moral character in all these other areas. And so that's just not, like, one thing does not necessitate the other, right? Yes. So it's like, yeah, I mean, do most of the bands I grew up listening to, like, if you look at some of the people in the band, like, they're not people I would want to have over for dinner. You know, but like, yeah. you know, I mean, m you know, the biggest band in the world when I was a kid was Guns N' Roses, but like everybody in the world knows nobody wants to invite Axl Rose over for dinner. He's <laughs> he, like, he's known, he's well known <laughs> as being, you know, a giant pain in the ass to most people. And I'm not saying that he is, I actually don't know him personally, mm -hmm. but in terms of the reputation that precedes him, that's how he's known. Yeah. But they were still the biggest band in the world when I was a kid. And when a song of theirs comes on the radio, I'm not like morally torn as to like, oh, I got it. You know, granted, it's not the same thing. We're not comparing apples to apples, but mm -hmm. like. I think that in the U.S., somebody's saying, you know, if you listen to Asley Dying or you go to one of their concerts, that means you're supporting these things. No, because I'm so against these things personally. Mm -hmm. I'm spending the rest of my life against these things trying to undo the hurt that I've caused. So yes. there's no way by supporting me or Asley Dying that you're supporting anything in the in the, in the world of, of what I did. Like, I mean, here I am this many – I'm it's ten, almost 10 years later. I'm still talking about how much I hate what I did and how much I want to undo what I did. Yeah. You know, it's, it's. Uh, I think what people want to see from you, which uh, you li literally have like a lyric, which uh, you know, my, I put on like your new record, "A Shape by Fire," and I'm listening to my my own grave, blinded and blinded by, blinded by the pain, blinded by the selfishness, and that's the fact that you own up to that is, I, I think, is pretty huge. Um, real, real quick, and I think uh, it'll be time to squash it. Like, uh, I don't know if I, if I should say his name, but uh, we were on tour with the band this. Uh, this past uh, month, and got talking about Mitch, and he's uh, just having a really deep conversation. It's like, and he said, "Man, I, that was so. I, mean, I thought that was so selfish. What what that guy did to you? I mean, I mean, I thought you guys were gonna blow up, and all, and like, I we're going on we're going on ten years, and I never once thought about that situation in a selfish way. And like, I was like, damn, that that was fucking selfish of him, dude. Like, he affected all of our lives, and he damn near ruined it, you know, and." Yeah. Um, you know, we never, almost didn't even recover from it. That's a, that's a very selfish act. And obviously uh, he didn't, he doesn't have, um, like the opportunity, I guess you could say to, to fix that, you know, and, and you do. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's awesome to actually see you doing that, you know, cause I, I, I've seen, you know, people not even have that opportunity to actually fix that. So it's cool that, you know, th things like this, you're actually coming on here and, and talk and talking about, I think that's a, that's a big act of, uh, of owning it. It's huge. Yeah, I mean, there's no other way around it than to own it. I mean, um, when people get really upset about me or the, the fact that I'm able to do music again and they just want to unload about, like, how much they hate what I did, mm -hmm. the easiest thing for me to do is just, like, dude, I, I agree with you. I hate that, too. <laughs> like, I don't mm – -hmm. there's not a day that I've woken up since yeah. then where I'm, like, 
I wish I could undo all, not only what I did, but all the hurt, all mm -hmm. the things that surrounding it, all the ripple effect of other people. Like my sense of empathy for how actions affect other people has grown because I see not only the, the small circle of, of what the, the hurt that I caused mm -hmm. people directly around me and the hurt that I caused myself, but the ripple effect of, I mean, it goes all the way down the line to, you know, um, family members of my band, my band members or previous band members, you know, and, yes. you know, uh, other relationships that were taking on stress because of, of Asla dying going away and uh, crew members that were supposed to work for us that had to scramble to find new jobs. And, yes. you know, I'm, I'm very hyper aware of those things because I've sat there and thought with a tremendous amount of guilt of, of how terrible I feel about them. So when somebody says, I hate you and what you've done, I say, okay, the only difference I have is that I hate that version of me, that person, that era of my life, I hate that person and I hate what that person did. I don't mm -hmm. hate myself currently today. I mean, I, of course I struggle with self-love big time, but like, mm -hmm. it's not like, um, the difference between that person and me is I just differentiate like who I am now and who I was and yeah. they just don't differentiate that. And so it's a very easy thing for them, you know, to jump to hating me currently. It's not, it isn't rationally speaking. I understand how they got there and I, I don't want to like make them feel bad for hating me even just like, okay, if you hate me then you hate me, so what? I, I, got, yeah. I, I have no choice but to move on with my life. Mm -hmm. And Tim, I, I think you've done a good job um, moving on. And that's my personal opinion. People think uh, we can't be defined by our darkest moments. You know, we, I, that, that's so unfair than what, I mean, we're all human. No, no one has, as Jimi Hendrix said, you know, no, one, no one's hands are clean. So it's just weird, like we, people deserve re redemption and, uh, Another, another chance to grow and um, I, I think given your sit, situation you, you 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 deserve that and I think you are doing like the work as me as like a friend to 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 you and uh, I think that's you know you should be more the band you know because also me knowing Phil like man he worked his whole life just to play guitar you know he he yeah. deserves to be out there with with you and playing those, those, those songs that you guys work so hard on you know I mean what I mean what kind of world are we going to live in and we can't get people another chance yeah i mean i i uh i met some people that did some really really terrible things you know what i mean and yeah and i also met some people that that not, never got caught for in, insanely terrible things you know what mm -hmm. i mean and, yes. and you can tell a person's sincerity of course there are very, very manipulative people out there you know but like you can tell you know within a, a certain I don't know, I'd probably say within 10 minutes of talking to somebody, if you address some of those issues yes. and see how they respond. And then if you, you're not convinced enough in those 10 minutes, then watch them for 10 years. You know what I mean? But like, oh, wow. you know, but if somebody's sincere, it will come out. And so like, mm -hmm. I can't, you know, if let's just say um, 10 years from now, you know, I, I have some per, sort of repeat offense and do something terrible. It's obviously clearly not your fault or anybody's fault that, that thought like, hey, you know, I, I thought he deserved a second chance yes. is that I proved them wrong. And but but for me, like I have nothing but confidence in that like I am finally the person in life that I want to be. And it took me a long and it wasn't just after my incarceration. I mean, it was uh, I mean, even this past year and going through COVID, a lot of stuff, you know, a lot of stuff I've faced in therapy. Like I'm finally on the path and becoming who I want to be in life. So I, I feel good about that. Mm -hmm. But like that's that's a process. And um, man, I, I just I, I've repeated this so many times, but. Somebody hates me and they want to keep hating me. Like they're wasting their effort because just I mean, if they sit back and watch, it's it's gonna just time will tell. You know, everything comes out in the wash, as they say. You know. Yes. Yeah. Well. Well, Tim. Just. Uh, I mean, all, all you could do is keep going. Yeah. You know. Uh, you know. A lot of obviously, like a lot of people want you to stay around because I mean, we we've all seen like the numbers and like a lot, a lot of fans welcomed you and maybe you could say like love you now more more than ever i know uh it's where i didn't even know we we're gonna get, get into this so so much like to be honest uh you know you know you know i think maybe like you struggle like with like with self-love mm -hmm. like like you know and i i, I could de definitely tell and uh, you you're you're going through the processes and, and you're going through the feelings and the therapy in order to like, like to get there and that's not a that's a hard road man it, it takes years yeah even for, even for someone that doesn't have a complex situation like you i mean I, i'm at home i deal with that it takes years dude years of process you know i to go over like you know are you are you look, look look in the mirror i'm like i'm like um i'm unlovable and then you, to, to, to fix that takes years mm -hmm. you know and you, you gotta you know um 
listening to you talk about not having not having memories when you were five and then you having to work past that you know that that trauma it, it stays with you you know yeah I, I mean, uh, it, you know i mean i can sit here and say that i think you've done a lot more work than i have you know that that shit's really hard to like to process like your childhood trauma you know it takes a long time and uh you know uh like uh my biological mother like she uh she had like a boyfriend and I was, you know, I was like fucking three or four and he, he would beat me, you know? And then without, you know, you don't kind of realize it at the moment, but that stays with you. And you kind of, and something's weird about your late twenties. I noticed that like things start to manifest here and there. Things start, things start to pop up. And then, you know, then that starts major abandonment issues, major, like you can't even have a fucking girlfriend you can't even have like a best friend something something happens and you're like why why don't, why don't i feel this connection you look in the mirror like i am so unlovable you yeah. know and then uh to undo that and this here you go into therapy and, and and working past that probably feelings and you know uh now now you probably have memories prior to five you yeah, know? It's, yeah. Cra it's crazy when, when 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 you work that work out that it gets worse for like it, 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 you, you get worse it's so weird. Like, it's so fucked up how that happens. Like you, you want to attack something, uh, a fucking un unresolved deep issue in, in, in your subliminal subconscious that happened to you when you were five years old or, or younger, and you deal with it. Like most people don't. People, most people don't do that. They don't. But, but Tim, you did. And you feel worse for like for a sure. week or two or a month. And, like, yeah. and, you, you, and you probably went to your therapist like, what, what the fuck, dude? Yeah. I, I feel worse. Yeah. No, <laughs> yeah. I, I did actually went to her and I said, um, hey, I either need to see you more often because the time between sessions is is like killing me or I need to stop seeing you, you know? So that was what I said. Because, I mean, realistically, like, in, and I, I know I've used this analogy and I apologize if it's a tired analogy, but if you have an infected wound, you have to scrape away the infection first. You know, you have to get in there yeah. and like just really just hurt yourself more to pr Man. provide a situation where you can then heal. And, um, you know, that's, that's true in the early stages of trauma. Like, and, and one of the reasons is because rationally speaking, you haven't carried around, you know, that what abuse happened to you, like, you know, physically, like any kind of hitting towards like a child at that young age, you don't like rationally carry that around with you. Cause you don't have the rational mindset as a four year old to be like, Oh, okay. I'm going to like think through this process, yes. but emotionally it just stuck deep in there. And so you carry the emotions of that. Mm but then you don't know how to like identify them or put words to them because yes. you're still like a four-year-old that doesn't have words for those things yet. Yes. You know, so it's, it's, it's hard to uncover that stuff. It is, man. And it's, it's hard even just like to, a simple decision like you going to therapy or a simple decision, oh, I'm gonna try to process it. That, that simple fucking half second decision, most people don't do that. So I, it's well, that, that part's not simple because that takes, it takes a lot of balls like to go to the, you know, or guts or whatever, you know, to be yeah. gender uh, uh, neutral here. But it takes a lot of guts to, go to a therapist and say, um, I want you to pull out the biggest struggles of my life and bring them all to the surface. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to come up with a game plan where it might even financially be expensive, you know, because my insurance might not cover the, the whole process. Yeah. And then we're going to come up with a game plan where I'm going to do whatever it takes to like work through that. That's, that takes guts. It does. Yeah. Isn't that kind of fucked up that you're trying to be a decent person in society and like, oh, wait, is my insurance going to cover it? Probably not. <laughs> it makes no fucking sense, dude. Why? Why do we have insurance? Yeah, you know, like we we should be able to uh, that should be able to be handled. I mean, the good news is there are other there are other supplementary um, sources like uh, like I know um, Jake from August Burns Red does heart support, and you know, so mm -hmm. when people reach out and they say, "Hey, my insurance doesn't cover this, but I've been through some trauma, or I I struggle with depression, or whatever," they'll say, "Okay, you know, we'll we'll help you the best we can," and they 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 usually can provide them a certain amount of free counseling. Or wow. um, um, I do know that. Um, Shockingly, uh, for people like in the state of California that are, that are Medi-Cal, mm -hmm. Medi-Cal will actually cover a certain amount of sessions with a mental health uh, therapist up up until like they determine whether or not you have a diagnosis. And so mm -hmm. they can like drag it out and they can say, oh, it's going to take me eight sessions to determine if this person needs a diagnosis. So like, you know, for instance, if if a person's not, you know, uh, suffering from clinical depression or, or bipolar or, or something that's like more on the drastic end of the spectrum mm – -hmm. They, the therapist won't technically know that for eight sessions, so they can get eight sessions covered just in the discovery process, um, and which eight sessions is, is quite a bit, you know? So, wow. Um, 
you know, there there are more resources for people out there than they might think. Yeah. I guess, uh, yeah, you should, we should try to find those resources. Yeah. And I want to mention it because I, I don't want people to be discouraged and say, like, oh, I'll never be able to afford that. Mm. Um, I mean, if it was a cash out of pocket situation, I mean, the average therapist, you know, you, you're, you're getting a great deal if you're paying a hundred to 150 bucks, you know what I mean? Like, so like that's Damn. for an hour, you know, that's cash pay situation, but, uh, insurance is largely like try to cover at least the, the exploration to find out if you have, because in, in their case, you know, it's like, um, a person say a person is bipolar and they need to be on Seroquel or whatever it is that they need to be on mm-hmm. a, a Seroquel pill is like you know 20 cents right so yeah. they can find the they can spend the eight sessions d- discovering if that's what the person needs you know mm-hmm. they'll they'll spend that money um to, to build you know and that's a whole nother we don't need to get into that rabbit hole sure. of like sure. the medication pushing that some sure, of these sure. <laughs> people are doing but but at least yeah. you know at least take advantage of the fact that you can you can get the eight sessions to discover that that's that's uh, great news, and uh, uh, I went to therapy like uh, for, for for a while, and like there was again like we won't, won't go down the rabbit hole, but there was like, hey Chris, you should take some uh, some some of that. I'm like, yeah. Luckily, I was at a point in my life where I was like reading some books. I'm like, oh, I'm fine. You yeah. Know? <laughs> Thank God. Dude. But yeah, good. There, there's resources, and then shout out to uh, to Jake from Argus Prince Red. He seems like a very special guy, and I, yeah. I, I know I know he's a, he's a special special guy to you. Yeah, and you and know? so one of the things that, that I'm inspired by Jake is that um, Jake's Jake's uh, a Christian and he comes from that standpoint. Like, you know, I serve others because I, I believe that's what, what Jesus commanded. But but the vast majority of his motivation is that he's suffered a lot in his life. He's gone through a lot of personal trauma and difficult mm-hmm. experiences uh, from childhood through going through divorce and all kinds of things that he's gone through. And that's given him a tremendous amount of compassion. That's like, dude, I don't want other people to suffer as I've suffered. And I think that's really uh, like a, a powerful thing for him that motivates him. Yeah. What's your foundation like like now? Like, um, I'm, I, it sounds like you you and Phil are are friends again. You know, it sounds like you have like a, a, a getting like a solid foundation in in your life. So, so how how's that going? That's good. Uh, I mean, I will say this much that um, you know, having two guys running a business is a lot easier than having five guys running a business. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Sure. You know, just. Hey, I got one about this idea. I just call Phil. You know what I mean. I don't have to Great. put in the calendar. Hey, three weeks from now, can we do a conference call and possibly meet? And maybe somebody will cancel, and you know that kind of thing. Oh yeah, yeah. You know what I mean. That that's like a very arduous process. So for me to just uh, you know text Phil, hey, are you free later today? I want to uh, run some ideas by you. You know that's a great process for him and I to to bounce things around. And then um, you know with Ryan Neff, Ken Susie, Nick Pierce, those guys um, to that to. When they come and, and perform with us, it's just like we're excited to be performing. You know what I mean? Like we're yeah. we're so focused on this, and uh, I don't know. Just the the vibe between us is incredible. Um, I mean, to be able to do a record with those guys is is exciting. It's kind of like a breath of fresh air. You yes. know, like a, a second chapter for us. And so, um, you know, I've, I've just sent Ken some demos to show him, like, hey, here's some ideas I'm working on. And um, well, historically, Phil and I have always written. It's nice to to like have somebody who's so excited to just like rip open a demo and be like, oh, I, I, let me change that one riff for you. You know what I mean? Like, Oh, wow, that's cool. You know, and, and uh, I mean, he's obviously a much better guitar player than I am, you know, and so um, yeah, I'm, I'm just excited. It's a, it's a breath of fresh air. Yeah, what's the what's the future of, of the band looking like for you guys? Um, you know, we need to start working on a new record, and, and I guess that will help determine the official status of, you know, if everybody, if they're like, permanent members and all that kind of stuff and mm-hmm. I don't want to put my foot in my mouth announcing anything before it's supposed to be announced you know what I mean but um I can just say that I'm really happy working with those guys and uh you know the fact that communication is not a burden like um if if I were to say to the, the group of all five guys that hey uh you know I want to get on the phone as soon as possible I mean I, I'd be shocked if it wasn't tomorrow you know what I mean and that's that's something I haven't had in I mean, even the last couple of years of, of as of before I was incarcerated, so maybe going back to like 12 years ago, to get all five of us just on a phone call together was like, mm-hmm. I mean, it was like pulling teeth, you know? And it's just like to, yeah. you know, and it's like this is something we technically should be excited about. Like, oh, cool, we get to like talk about a new song. Oh, great, like let me clear my schedule. That's like yeah, yeah. nothing in life is more exciting to me than than the creative process and creating something out of nothing. Yeah, I mean, you, I literally like had the... Have one of the best jobs on the fucking planet, man. Yep. You can play music, write music, create music, go on, play all these shows, man, and have like a 
now, especially must be like, so it's definitely different for, like, for you guys now. Like you have like this welcoming fan base now. That's, that's, mm. that's a, that's a big family now, man. It's, yeah. it's so cool. And yeah, there is like, you know, some, some members just, just make it harder. Yeah. You know? and, and, and sometimes it's, I mean, Hey, I, if, by the way, to clarify, I'm not complaining because, you know, if, if I'm the guy that, that made getting on the phone feel like, Oh God, listen to Tim talk for you know, 20 minutes or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. I, I could be the reason there was that dread about getting on the phone calls. I'm not complaining. I'm just saying for whatever reason, the reasons were, it created that, that type of dynamic. Yeah. And even if it was just for it's the sake of making it easy, let's just say it's 100% my fault. It, regardless of whose fault it is, it's, a, it's a bad pattern and, and it's nice to just have like a, a clean, nice, healthy pattern going forward. Yeah. It seems, and you're right. You said, you said some key words. It sounds like the, the pattern you guys are on. It's, it's very healthy Yeah, and it's very, uh, mo Moving forward, and you said the uh, key word. I say uh, much, much as I can on, on on this fucking thing. Communication. Mm -hmm. You, you got com we're, we're communicating now. You're 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 uh, communicating to to your fans and people that choose to to watch and and uh, listen. So yeah, we have, you got to communicate, man. You have to. It's huge. Yeah, it's good. It's good to see you doing that. Yeah, and, and it's easy. It's not a painful process anymore. So I mean, I mm -hmm. I can't like think about the next record without like positive. Uh, thoughts about it you know and the idea yeah. of like uh, like i mentioned when we did awakened um you know it kind of got to where it was it was a little bit of a strained process i think the record still came out great but it was yeah you know we were talking about the, the past and and just how bizarrely isolated we all got during that record um mm -hmm. i mean this is we all the five of us collectively said at the end of our european summer tour just say, hey guys like this this was like one of the most fun tours we've ever done we both we've all been doing music for almost 20 years you know yeah. it's like wow like be able to say that this was you know some of the most fun we've ever had in our whole careers that's that means something it means something and it looks like you guys are having a great time yeah it's it's, it's, it's really cool to see you, tim uh anything else you uh that you think that we that 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 we haven't covered oh uh, man i i mean we covered a lot so uh, yeah great <laughs> cool well, it's, it's really cool to see ken cc playing with yeah you guys love that guy man i will, I will fucking jam on earth when, when when i was a kid man great a, a great a great guitar player i think uh since you guys are in like like like, like a similar era, it, it feels good, you know. For sure, yeah. You they know? started, I think, even a year before Asley Dying, or maybe even two. So, and the first time I heard them, um, I realized, oh, cool, I'm I'm creating music that I want to create. But if I want to really be on the level of what I enjoy, I need to become a better guitar player because yes. those guys were the. F I think they're the first bands to do like like a breakdown with sweeps, you know, or like just that metal true, metal huh? core with like with like shreddy actual shreddy parts. And obviously. You know, modern bands have like progressed and taken that whole formula, but um, they were yeah. the first to me, you know, that I'm that I'm aware of. And so when I first heard them, I was like, okay, cool. To do what I want to do, I need to become a better guitar player. And I I felt relatively limited, but Phil, you know, Phil is that better guitar player that I wanted to be. So but thank thank God that Phil is is uh is able to to write songs like that. Yeah, totally. It's how it's how I, I view Mark. I, I just want to do chug chug, but like I can't like. Ooh. I can't, yeah, but, but yeah. You, you were way better than me, so you, you fucking knew it. <laughs> oh, yeah. And now, now uh, you know, we got we got two of them, you know, because we got Ken and Phil, so. Damn, two rippers, dude. Yeah, yeah. Again, shout out to Phil, dude. He's a phenomenal guitar player that I feel he doesn't get talked about enough. Yeah, it's it's, it's interesting because a lot of uh, guitar players, the, the guy that plays the leads on stage, at least, is the guy that, like, everybody's like, oh, that, that must be the great guitar player in the band. Uh, and Nick was, was a great guitar player. Um, Nick, too. But uh, Nick played the leads because Phil wrote the, the vast majority of the, of the songs, and so we always wanted to have that as, like, Nick's showcase section, right? Yes. But it wasn't because Phil was incapable of doing it. Sure. And so almost in, like, a very humble way, Phil sort of, like, stepped out of the spotlight, and, and people just didn't know all those years that, oh, he could do that, too, if he wanted to. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so now now Phil's up there playing the rhythms and the leads on, on a lot of the songs, and... and um, you know, it's it's funny because it wasn't intimidating. It wasn't like, oh man, he's got to become a better guitar player. No, he was a great guitar player. He just, you know, he just sort of chose that. I don't know that that back seat when it comes to those like spotlighty moments. And uh, now he's doing it all. Now he's doing it all, man. Mm -hmm. And I, I know uh, I know Phil is also doing like some behind the scenes stuff, like you know, may uh, making sure like the band's on on point. You know, like uh, as far as like the managing and stuff. And that and that yeah. and that's a takes a very patient intelligent guy while also create cre creating music so that that he's a he's a special guy man for sure you know you got i think you guys are sounds cheesy to say i always say about me and mitch but you yeah, guys are just meant to be with each other yeah you know yeah. so like, it's funny when you, when you meet someone like oh i didn't know i'm gonna 
pretty much marry you, dude. And <laughs> we're, we're always talking to each other. We're always writing music. We're going, we're in all these airplanes, all these little little bands worldwide. Yeah. So it's cool that you guys, you guys found each other and have uh, shared that that deep love with uh, with music, man. Yeah. And Tim, uh, I'm grateful. Yeah. It's, it, I mean, you, Tim, you look grateful. Yeah. It's cool, man. And, and, and coming from from me, I mean, it's it's great to see you guys back. You know, I think you guys have earned it, you know, and just just keep doing what what you're doing, and that's that's that, that's all we can do. But it's it's great it's great to see you see you guys back, Tim. Yeah, man, thanks for having me. By the way, too, it's a it's a real honor because I, I don't do very many interviews at all ever, uh, largely because it's it's a very vulnerable thing for me, and so I have to yes. feel very comfortable. And yes. thank you for making this a comfortable situation. Oh, I, I, I was honored to have you. I was I was really look, looking forward to hanging out with you and just looking forward to listening. So I'm glad, you know, it's all great to see you. We fucking, we've been in a fucking small ass bus uh, somewhere out in Europe. I don't fuck, yeah. I don't, I don't even know. But Tim, good. It's very, it's very good seeing you. I'm really look, looking forward to what you guys are doing next. Um, and I guess that's it. Where can people find you? Uh, find the band? Um, all the Azalea Dying socials, I think, are are just Azalea Dying, with the exception of I think one of them is like Twitter or something is Azalea Dying Band. But cool. uh, that that should be easy to find. And then most of my handles are just at Tim Lambesis. So cool. Um, trying to keep everything updated and uh, find that balance of not being on social media too much. It's a tough balance, dude. Yeah. Good luck. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still trying to find that. Yeah. All right, Tim. Great, great seeing you, everyone. That that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Later.